I'm glad that you guys are here. I know a lot of people have been anticipating this for a while. I'm sure more people will trickle in, but uh, we've got the live stream going, and so we want to we want to uh, to honor Marv's time as well. We appreciate so much that he is here uh, with us. Um, but this is a Sunday school class that, that I know I'm, I'm very excited for. So, again, we're glad that you guys are here. I'm going to pray, and then Heather is going to introduce Marv so that you guys know a little bit more about him, and then, uh, and then Marv is going to get started. So let's pray. Father God, we, we thank you, Lord, for who you are. Uh, we thank you for all that you do, God, and we thank you, Lord, that you have given us truth. Uh, that truth is not relative to our circumstances or our environment, uh, but that truth supersedes all those things. And so, God, we, we desire that truth. Uh, we, we do not desire uh, man-made religions. We do not desire um, these, these boxes that we find ourselves in so often. We desire, Lord, you. And, God, you have revealed your, yourself, your truth to us in your word and so, God, uh, we just pray that you would uh, deepen our trust in that word, deepen our trust in you. And we pray, Lord, that you would be glorified and magnified uh, through all of it. We pray for Marv, Lord, that you would uh, just be with him. I pray that you would speak to him and speak through him. I pray that you would use him to edify and sanctify the body. Uh, so we thank you for him, Lord. We lift all these things up to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, gosh, this is a great honor. <laughs> uh, Don would be doing this, but he's doing his outdoor greeting people as they come in. But Don and I um, moved to Utah in 1980. And two of the very first people that we met were Marv and his wife, Jan, um, at Sandy Baptist Church. We became very fast friends. We knew nothing about Mormonism when we came here from Massachusetts. We were relatively new Christians, and Marv was a wealth of information and help to us at that time. We spent so much time together, and Don will tell you that Marv, though Marv would never say it, and half the time doesn't realize it, has been Don's mentor. Um, along with Jan, we would meet with them Often we would see them every week, and even after we were not at Sandy anymore, and Don came back to pastor, then um, we would get together very often, the two of them as mentors. Don for our Marv for Don, and Jan for me, because I was entering being a pastor's wife very, very late in my life, <laughs> so I needed a lot of help. But anyway, um, it's been amazing, and you would be interested to know that today, as you are sitting in this church, there are four generations here of Marv. There's Marv and uh, Cynthia Edwards and her daughter, Ariana Jackson, and their baby, um, Serenity. So that's just kind of a, a cool thing. But Marv's uh, relatives were among the Mormon pioneers. This is on the back, by the way, of this book. These books are available on the back table in the kitchen, free to you. The church has purchased them for, for people, so they are free to you to get them. But um, there's a lot of good information right here on the back. They were among the Mormon pioneers who settled Utah, and at the age of 12, Marv was ordained as a deacon in the Aaronic priesthood. His zeal in trying to proselyze his friends later led to discussions that raised serious questions. Subsequent studies led him to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Marv received his Master's of Divinity from Denver Seminary in 1960. Uh, he was awarded a, an honorary um, doctorate in 1961. He has served as a church planter here in Utah he has pastored churches. He has shared the truth of the gospel with countless people. His passion is to see the Mormon people who are such dear people come to know the true Jesus of the Bible. And to that end, he's going to help us 
so that we can be better witnesses as we share the gospel with our friends, relatives, and neighbors. So with that, Marv, come and teach us. Well, it's good to be with you today. Uh, can you all hear me? Uh, I want to make sure that my mic is on so you can hear. Anybody cannot hear? Okay. Um, in the introduction, you heard that uh, I have a Mormon background. That's the reason I have an interest in Mormons. But I want to make it clear as we begin today that uh, Mormons are not our enemies. Um, they're people just like us. When I was a Mormon, I was just as sincere then as I am now. But what I believed was very, very different. Paul said in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, that is humans, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, and against spiritual wickedness in high places. That's where our enemy is. And by the way, back in um, Ephesians chapter 1, I think it's verses 20 and 21, it says that Christ, when he was raised from the dead, ascended above all of those things. So he's above all of that. We're not yet. And so we still have some battles to to deal with, but they're spiritual battles. You know, <clears throat> uh, if you've been watching, you know that Mormonism is um, attempting to say that they are Christians. And um, the current prophet uh, says that they are to use the full name of the church, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And if you've talked to some Mormons, they may have told you there are no Mormons. There's only members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And, and uh, there's a real emphasis right now to use that full name. The question I have is, why now? Mormonism began in 1820, uh, 1830, and um, they were originally called the Church of Christ. But there was already a Church of Christ, the Camelite Church of Christ, and uh, <clears throat> so there was some confusion. And in 1834, they changed the name to the Church of the Latter-day Saints. And then on April 17th of 1838, Joseph Smith claimed that he had um, a revelation from God that the name of the church should be the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. That was... April 17th, 1838. That's 184 years ago. Since that time, every Mormon prophet and every Mormon apostle, as well as most of the members, have referred to the Mormon church as the Mormon church or the LDS church. So the question, why the emphasis now on the name after 184 years? It's part of the program to try to show the world that they are Christians. Uh, some of you remember uh, back in uh, about the mid-1990s, uh, they were told to increase the size of the name Jesus Christ in the name of their church on their buildings. And if you've looked at their buildings, you'll see the church of in smaller letters uh, and Jesus Christ in larger letters and then of Latter-day Saints in smaller letters. Why did they do that? It's to try to convey the idea that they are believers in Jesus Christ. The current prophet also uh, told them that um, in, in the foyers of the, the ward chapel buildings, they have uh, pictures of uh, Mormon prophets, usually is what you, you would see, until now. And... Uh, <clears throat> the current prophet said, take those pictures down and put up pictures of Jesus Christ. And uh, so these are all things to convey the idea that uh, Mormonism is Christian. 
But those are all just window dressings. It doesn't change what they believe. They want to be called Christians, but they don't want to accept Christian doctrine. And they don't want to give up the unique doctrines that Joseph Smith gave them. They just want to be called Christians. And all of this window dressing that we see is to try to convey the idea that they are Christians in spite of the fact they don't believe Christian doctrine, at least the most part of the Christian doctrine. Now, they're nice people. I was a nice guy as a young woman. I won my first convert when I was in the seventh grade. I believed in it. I didn't know any different. And I wasn't trying to deceive, and I don't think the average Mormon is trying to deceive somebody else either. But what they teach and what they believe is very different. Um, you know, Jesus said in Matthew 7, uh, verses uh, 22 and 3, that there would be many who would come in uh, saying uh, that they are prophesying in the name of the Lord, they're casting out devils in the name of the Lord, they're doing uh, marvelous, miraculous things in the name of the Lord. And Jesus said in verse 23 of Matthew 7, then will I profess to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. Those who are pretending and uh, using the name of Christ, he doesn't know, and they're not going to spend eternity with him. Uh, and that was his message. You know, Paul also said in Second um, Timothy chapter 4, uh, verses 3 and 4, I believe it is, where he says that, um, there will be those uh, who will have itching ears and they, they'll turn away their ears from the truth and be turned into fables or myths. You know what a myth is? It's not real. Um, now, um, the 10th Mormon prophet, Joseph Fielding Smith, said in his book, Doctrines of Salvation, Volume 1, on page 188, that Mormonism, as it's called, must stand or fall on the story of Joseph Smith. Did you notice that? First of all, he said Mormonism. He didn't say the Church of Jesus Christ. He said Mormonism, as it's called, must stand or fall, not on Jesus Christ, but on the story of Joseph Smith. And so for a little while this morning, I'd like to... Um, talk about that story of Joseph Smith. Now, many of you are probably familiar with it, and I know it's going to be a um, kind of a rehearsing of something you already know, but some of you may not, so I want to go over some of it so that you understand the foundation on which Mormonism is built. And by the way, <clears throat> I intend to end what I have to say a little early so that you have a chance to ask questions. And if you have questions, uh, be sure to uh, keep them in mind. And when we stop, I'll try to answer them. I don't claim to have all the answers, but there may be some things that I can't answer. So to go to this story of Joseph Smith, it's actually scripture for Mormons. It's in the Pearl of Great Price. It's called the Joseph Smith History. And uh, <clears throat> in the uh, Joseph Smith history, uh, in the Pearl of Great Price, Smith says in verse 3 that uh, I was born in the year of our Lord, 1805, on the 23rd day of December in the town of Sharon, Windsor County, state of Vermont. Now, <clears throat> um, uh, notice he was born... December 23rd uh, of 1805. There was only eight days left in 1805 when he was born. And then he says in, <clears throat> um, still in verse 3, uh, my father Joseph Smith Sr. left the state of Vermont and moved to Palmyra, Ontario, now Wayne County in the state of New York, when I was in my 10th year or thereabouts. And in about four years after my father's arrival in Palmyra, he 
moved with his family into Manchester in the same county of Ontario. And then in verse 4, he's talking about uh, the, the members of his family. And he mentions in verse 4, my brother Alvin, who died November 19th, 1823, in the 26th year of his age. I want you to keep that in mind, too. So these are things I'm going to refer to. Um, <clears throat> and then um, verse 5 says, Sometime in the second year after our removal to Manchester, there was in the place where we lived an unusual excitement on the subject of religion. It commenced with the Methodist, but soon became general among all the sects in that region of the country. And he says, great multitudes united themselves to the different religious parties, uh, some contending for the Methodist faith, some for the Presbyterian, and some for the Baptist. And <clears throat> uh, anyway, he's talking about a great uh, revival uh, where multitudes of people were joining these churches. And that's what uh, concerned him. He said he was naturally um, uh, inclined to be religious, but he didn't know which church to join. And so after reading James 1.5, which says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth all men liberally, and abradeth not, it shall be given him. And so he says he went to God in prayer, and uh, uh, he went out into the woods, actually, from his home, and went to God in prayer and asked which church was right or which of the sects were right and which he should join. Now, notice he didn't ask for wisdom. He asked for knowledge. There is a difference. And uh, he says he was first overcome with a great power of darkness. And then uh, two personages stood above him in the light, and one pointed to the other and said, This is my beloved son, hear him. And Smith finally asked him which of all the sects was right and which he should join. And he says he was told um, that, uh, that, that he was not to join any of them because they were all wrong, uh, all their creeds are an abomination, and all those professors, that's those who profess to believe, are corrupt. And that's the foundation of Mormonism as far as the concept of a universal apostasy, and I hope you understand that. When they talk about a universal apostasy, they mean there was no true church on the earth for 17 to 1800 years. No true gospel, no true church, until Joseph Smith restored it on April 6th of 1830. That's um, the basic part of the story until you get to the gold plates, which comes a little later. But I want to go back and take a look at what uh, is recorded right here in Mormon scripture. Now, I hope you can do a little bit of math with me. Uh, you notice he says he was born in 1805, and in his 10th year, they moved uh, to Palmyra. You know, all the Mormon uh, uh, history books that I've seen say that that was in 1816, since there was only eight days left in 1805 when he was born. If he was 10, it probably was 1816. So. They say it's 1816 when they moved to Palmyra, uh, and four years later they moved to Manchester, and then um, two years after uh, moving to Manchester, there was this great revival. So that would put the date at what? 1822. Now notice in Mormon scripture what it says. Let me turn to it here. Uh, and this is in verse 14. Uh, he says, this is when he's going to ask God about what churches are right. I retired to the woods to make <clears throat> the attempt to pray, and it was on the morning of a beautiful clear day early in the spring of 1820. 
This was after the big revival, after they moved to Manchester, and so forth. Do you see a problem? This problem is right in Mormon scripture. The chronology doesn't add up. If they um, moved to Palmyra when he was 10, and Manchester four years later, that was 1820. Two years later, there was this big revival. After the revival, he's going to ask God which church to join. There is a problem right in Mormon scripture. And <clears throat> at any rate, um, uh, this story of um, this first vision, as I mentioned, he said he went out there in the woods to pray, and while he was praying, he was overcome with the power of darkness, and he exerted all of his might and overcame it, and then there was this great light with two personages that they now identify as God the Father and God the Son. And the Father pointed to his Son and said, this is my beloved Son, hear him. And uh, it was the Son who told Joseph Smith uh, not to join any of the churches. They're all wrong, all their creeds. And a creed is a simple summary statement of the doctrine. That's all it is uh, of the Christian church. They're all wrong. And all the professors, that's people like you, are all corrupt. So this is the basis of a universal apostasy and the reason that Mormonism claims that it needs uh, to have a, a restoration of the one true church. Now, <clears throat> the irony of it is that uh, Joseph Smith uh, didn't record any of that until, well, it was actually written in 1838, but it wasn't published until 1842. That's 22 years after it supposedly happened, when it was first published. And you look in vain, for example, for the earlier Mormon prophets, Brigham Young and um, John Taylor, Wilford Woodruff, to actually talk about that first vision. It didn't seem to be known. It's not in any of the literature or anything uh, prior to the publication of the uh, Wentworth letter, which. Uh, is part of what we, what's in Mormon scripture now. Um, but that, that came much, much later. The interesting thing to me is that Joseph Smith wrote in a diary about what happened. And this is a photocopy of the uh, handwritten diary by Joseph Smith himself. Um, I'm going to read from a printed text of that. It's a little easier for me to read, but I want you to notice what he said, and this this is not really contemporary yet. This is 1832. This is uh, 12 years uh, after his first vision, and <clears throat> according to the Mormon scripture anyway. But he says, uh, from the age of 12 to 15, I pondered many things in my heart concerning the situation of the world, of mankind, the contentions and divisions, of the wickedness and the abominations and the darkness which pervaded um, <clears throat> the minds of mankind. Um, my mind became exceedingly distressed, for I became convic uh, convicted of my sins. And by searching the scriptures, I found that mankind did not come to the Lord, but that they had apostatized from the true and living faith, and that there was no society or denomination that built upon the gospel of Jesus Christ as recorded in the New Testament. Do you see the problem here? This is in his own handwriting in 1832. And this... Um, that we read in Mormon scripture didn't come out until 1842. Now, um, he, he says from the scriptures he learned that mankind had apostatized and that there was no uh, denomination built on the gospel of Jesus Christ as recorded in the New Testament. So he found that from the scripture instead of from 
uh, a revelation by God the Father and God the Son. Now, he's going on, <clears throat> this is on page three of his diary, and this is in his own handwriting. He said, I cried unto the Lord for mercy, for there was none else to whom I could go and to obtain mercy. And the Lord heard my cry in the wilderness. And uh, <clears throat> uh, while in an attitude of calling upon the Lord, in the 16th year of my age, a pillar of light above the brightness of the sun at noonday came down from above and rested upon me. And I was filled uh, with the Spirit of God. And the Lord opened the heavens upon me. And I saw the Lord. And he spake unto me, saying, Joseph, my son, thy sins are forgiven thee. Go thy way, walk in my statutes, and keep my commandments. Behold, I am the Lord of glory. I was crucified for the world, that all those who believe on my name may have eternal life. Do you notice anything different in what he wrote in his diary? There's, there's an important person missing uh, in this vision that he had of Christ, there's no God the Father. It's just uh, uh, the Lord himself uh, speaks to him. And he says <clears throat> that uh, the Lord told him, uh, Joseph, my son, thy sins are forgiven thee. Nothing about all the churches being wrong and uh, all of that. So it's a very different story. And this is the uh, this is Joseph Smith on which Mormonism rests, like uh, Joseph Fielding Smith said. By the way, Joseph Fielding Smith was a grand nephew of Joseph Smith. And uh, <clears throat> um, he said, Mormonism, as it's called, must stand or fall on the story of Joseph Smith. But the story of Joseph Smith gets kind of squishy because there's several different stories. In fact, I've got here um, one paper with nine different versions that he told different people about the first vision. And uh, let's see, I think I've got the one. Yeah, this is the one uh, I, uh, I found kind of interesting. Um, this is from Wilford Woodruff. Some of you may recognize his name. He was the fourth Mormon prophet. And uh, <clears throat> he's talking about how the church began, the Mormon church. And he said, how did it commence? It commenced by an angel of God flying through the midst of heaven and visiting a young man named Joseph Smith in the year 1827. That was the time of a great awakening among the sectarians of the day, uh, the day of revivals and protracted meetings when people were called upon to join themselves to the sectarian churches. This young man looked around amid the confusion among the different sects, each proclaiming the plan of salvation differently and each claiming it was right and the, all the others were wrong. In the midst of this contention, he did not know which to join, while in this state of uncertainty, he turned to the Bible and there saw that passage in the epistle of James, which directs him that lacks wisdom to ask of God. That's uh, James 1, 5. And uh, <clears throat> so he went into his secret chamber and asked the Lord what he must do to be saved. The Lord heard his prayer and sent his angel to him, who informed him that all the sects were wrong and that the Lord, uh, that the God of heaven was about to establish his work upon the earth. Do you see any problem? It's very different from what's in Mormon scripture. Now keep in mind that Mormonism and uh, Mormon people often quote Amos 3.7. Surely the Lord God doeth nothing, but he revealeth his secrets to his servants, the prophets. This was one of the prophets. Did the Lord reveal the wrong message to this man or to Joseph Smith or just what, what is the problem? The foundation of Mormonism is very shaky when you start looking at it. You know, um, I was doing some research um, 
back in Palmyra many years ago. And uh, <clears throat> at that time, the uh, uh, Pearl of Great Price, this was prior to 1980, uh, in that uh, section about uh, Alvin's death that I mentioned, keep in mind, uh, this is what it said uh, in the pre-1980 Pearl of Great Price. Alvin, who died November 19th, 1824, in the 27th year of his age. The current one says that he was 26 and died uh, November 19th, 1823. Now, when I was back uh, in Palmyra, I was in the library, and they had a lot of microfilms of the early um, uh, period in Palmyra. And I ran across... Um, this is an ad by Joseph Smith Sr. And it's dated September 25th, 1824. And it appeared in three editions of the paper, the same ad um, that he paid for to put in the Wayne Sentinel newspaper. He says, whereas reports have been uh, industriously put in circulation that my son Alvin had been removed from the place of his interment and dissected, which report uh, every person possessed of human sensibility must know are uh, peculiarly calculated to harrow up the mind of a parent and deeply wound the feelings of, and so forth. And then he says... I, with some of my neighbors, this morning repaired to the grave, that's Alvin's grave, and removing the earth, found the body which had not been disturbed. This is September 25th, 1824. Now, when I got this, I had the Pearl of Great Price that said Alvin died November 19th, 1824. You see a problem? I did. You can't dig up a body two years before it's in the grave. And so I went looking for the, the grave itself, and uh, I took pictures of it. This, these are just from my little camera. Uh, there's two tombstones on his grave. This is the old one, and this is the, the newer one that's more readable. Uh, you can read them both, but they both say he died November 19th, 1823. So I realized that Mormon scripture was wrong. And in the meantime, I had also read in the documentary history of the church uh, in volume one that Alvin died November 19th, 1825. And I thought, wait a minute. Now I've got 1823, 1824, 1825. Now this is the church that majors in genealogies and the claim they've got uh, great documentation and so forth. And I thought, man, if this is any indication of how reliable their um, uh, genealogy stuff is, I, I don't think it's very reliable. But anyway, <clears throat> what I want to point out is that um, when Alvin died, <clears throat> Uh, there was a Presbyterian minister who was visiting Palmyra at that time. Uh, his name was Stockton, and he was asked to preach the funeral sermon for Alvin in 1823, and he did. And he indicated that Alvin went to hell because he wasn't a religious young man. <laughs> That's pretty, pretty sharp, um, uh, I guess, against the, the family. Anyway, the father, Joseph Smith Sr., uh, said he would not go to the revival after it came after Alvin was uh, buried. What does that tell you? William Smith on Mormonism is a book by Joseph Smith's brother. He was one of the original 12 apostles. And in his book, William Smith on Mormonism, he mentions Alvin's death and uh, Stockton preaching this, this message where he said he went to hell and that uh, 
um, Joseph Smith Sr., wouldn't go to the revival after that because of what he had said about Alvin. So that means that the um, revival had to be after Alvin's death sometime. And um, uh, William Smith mentions both Reverend Stockton and Reverend Lane of the Methodist Church as the leaders of that revival. Reverend Stockton came to Palmyra to be the pastor in February of 1824. He wasn't the pastor when he preached the sermon. He was just a visiting pastor. But um, <clears throat> Reverend Lane didn't come until July 1824. But Reverend Lane had some illness and left the ministry in January 1825. So the only time those two men could uh, have served together uh, in a revival was in the latter half of 1824. Was there a revival at that time? Indeed there was. Uh, approximately 100 people joined each of the churches, the Baptist, Methodist, and Presbyterian. Well, the Methodist was a circuit that had actually 200, but there were several preaching points that were included in that. But uh, at any rate, um, there is no record of any uh, revival in 1820 in Palmyra. You know, back in those days, the um, uh, the church was really kind of a, a center of social activity, and the newspapers were uh, really one of the uh, only means of telling what's going on in the community and so forth. And um, they didn't have anything about revivals in 1820, and uh, yet in 1824, yes, they had the paper was full of it. Um, so it shows me that that's the revival that Smith was talking about, but it wasn't in 1820, it was in 1824. And if that was the revival that uh, sent him to ask God which church to join, and uh, according to all the records it is, because it, it, they named those two pastors as leaders of the revival, Reverend Lane and Reverend Stockton, and uh, they did lead a revival in 1824. So the, um, the first vision of Joseph Smith, if it was after that, had to be uh, no earlier than the spring of 1825. But if it is in the spring of 1825, it's no longer the first vision because Joseph Smith said the angel Moroni appeared to him uh, September 21st of 1823. The only way you can change that is to move Moroni's visit up um, and put it after 1825. If you do that, the earliest you could put it would be uh, September 21st of 1825, when Smith was told about the gold plates for the first time. But the angel came four years in succession before he got the gold plates to do the translation. So that would have been uh, September of uh, 1829. The problem there is the Book of Mormon was registered June 11th, 1829. So there's a great deal involved in the uh, original story about the founding of the Mormon Church that just doesn't add up. And yet, um, Mormonism claims to be the one and only true church on the face of the earth, based on Smith. Everything that Mormonism holds near and dear comes from Smith. They have three other books of scripture, all of them from Smith. And the organization and, and so forth, and the concept of the temples, everything goes right back to Joseph Smith. And I've had uh, Mormons tell me, I cannot know Jesus Christ except through Joseph Smith. Now, 
that's not what Jesus said. And that's not what the New Testament writers, uh, Paul said in 1 Timothy 2.5, there's one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. I don't need somebody else to tell me about Christ. Jesus himself said, he who believes on me has eternal life. John 6.47. And so Mormonism, uh, in fact, uh, uh, as large as it is and as influential as it is, is based on uh, a foundation built on sand. Uh, it, it'll crumble. And if you have a bad foundation, you can't build something very sturdy and, and solid on something that has a faulty foundation. And that's why I wanted to point uh, out some of these things that I found. A lot of this was during my early search uh, for uh, determining, was I going to remain a Mormon or uh, am I going to throw it overboard? Because I, I had some serious questions by this time. Um, I think I'll uh, stop there. I, 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 I want to leave at least 15 minutes uh, to see if there's questions uh, that you have that uh, I can answer. Um, I'd be happy to try. So let's uh, open it for questions and see. If you have questions, please come ask in the mic because we are live streaming. So we'll set it up here. What does the Mormon Church say about these discrepancies? Because they're obvious and they... Well, as you can imagine, uh, they're aware of them and they do make excuses. And they, uh, one of them is, well, there were revivals uh, in other areas around, but there weren't any revivals around where Joseph Smith was at that time. So it, it doesn't matter, but it, the, the revival was supposed to be in Palmyra, and it's very yeah. clear that that's where it was supposed to be. Uh, but they, they do things like that, and uh, I, I've had some say, it doesn't matter to me uh, about those details. The important thing is the church is true, <laughs> and they just they go that route. Oh, yeah. thank you. Marv, thank and praise you, and may God continue to keep you. You know I'm Mama Lois, okay? My biggest question mm -hmm. has always been, from my point of salvation, I was, I was raised in a Catholic Orthodox church, straight-laced, everything. But something didn't seem right to me, but my grandmother was a Christian, okay? My biggest thing when I was saved was, I do not like denominations, Marv, okay? And... I had to literally go and buy a Bible because I did not have one, but I, I know now it was the Holy Spirit that guided me to a Baptist church and mostly missionary Baptist church until this will be the second one because of my grandmother and what I read in the Bible about John the Baptist. Mm -hmm. I do not like denominations. <laughs> yeah. uh, denominations come about for various reasons. and. Uh, uh, one of the things I've appreciated in my ministry, I've uh, spoken in all kinds of denominations, uh, if the people believe in Jesus Christ as personal Savior, we can have fellowship. If they're trusting in their church or their own works or something else, um, it just isn't there. But there is, and, and um, Paul deals with the unity of the faith and the unity of the spirit, and that's the real uh, fellowship of, of Christians. It, it isn't just the denomination. Uh, were you going to? No. Barbara, I want to thank you, too, for coming. This has been awesome. I've been waiting. I've known you for a few years since we've been in Utah, and I've been waiting for this class, so I'm okay. grateful that we've had this opportunity. I was, uh, about a month ago, I drove down to Payson for a political meeting that was basically featuring Joel Skousen. And are you familiar with Joel? With what? Joel, Joel Skousen. He's the nephew of W. Oh. Cleon Skousen. Yeah. So he, um, he does... 
uh, he advises people on how to build secure homes and how to build secure communities, and I think has been part of establishing some of that within the Mormon Church. The, the meeting was about COVID and the stolen election and a number of other issues, which are quite uh, disputed. But it was supposed to be a two and a half hour meeting, and he, he only spoke for about an hour with the cameras running and recording going on. And then he shut down that political side of the meeting, and, and it became a, a Mormon meeting. And, and I kind of felt honored, not for the Mormon teaching, but as a Gentile, as a non-believer within their group, to hear what he had to say. And I, and I took some notes. He couldn't, he, they turned off all the cameras, turned off all the recording, because he was addressing the other Mormons, and I don't think they knew that uh, there were any non-Mormons there. But basically, he addressed your issue to an extent, and I'm curious to know more about your feeling on, on how they're covering this up. He acknowledged that there are errors in in the Mormon scriptures, and he acknowledged that the uh, the prophets disperse errors and that the president disperses errors. And, and what he said, I mean, I'm just going to read what he said because I wrote it down diligently. He said that the scriptures are purposely limited in information. He said the little things block your ability to understand error. And he went on to explain in length that he's not authorized to correct the errors of leadership. But nonetheless, he'll address them one time, like when the prophet misspeaks something or the president misspeaks, he'll get an audience, he'll go address it with them, and he'll talk to them about it. Um, but he says he's not ordained to fight them, so if they disagree with him, he just lets it go. But fundamentally, he said, don't get in the way of testing purposes, stay with the church, and the Lord will correct all of these errors one day. He says that the purpose of the errors is to test the believers, to test the people. Because if they're not tempted by their own leadership and by their own scriptures, then how can they really make a right decision to follow? He didn't say blindly, but that's how I interpreted it. I'm just curious what your thought on that. Had you heard of them covering it that way before? Well, it's interesting that he actually admits that they uh, have some problems because so many don't even want to admit that. But... Um, you know, back when I was in the church, uh, I was a teacher, and one of the word teacher's lessons was when our leaders speak, the thinking has been done. When they propose a plan, it is God's plan. And uh, it went on to indicate that if you varied from that, then you were headed for apostasy. But um, it's interesting today, uh, there's a, a whole array of Mormons there's liberal Mormons that um, I had one say, who knows whether there's a God or not? <laughs> and I said, uh, what did Joseph Smith say? Who knows what Joseph Smith said? <laughs> you know? But he was a, a teacher, an adult teacher in one of the Sunday school classes in a ward in California. And um, anyway, on the other end of the spectrum, you have some fundamentalists who are part of the Utah church. And I've dealt with some uh, that are practicing polygamist even that, uh, and so forth. Um, so it's, it's hard to answer uh, what every Mormon believes because they don't all believe the same. <laughs> A lot of them... In fact, I think probably the majority of them now are converts from other backgrounds, and a lot of them bring some of their uh, previous beliefs, not realizing it doesn't really gel with Mormonism. Uh, so there's a whole array of beliefs among Mormons, and I tend to stick with uh, what the prophets and their scriptures say, because that's the closest thing I can come to an official doctrine of the church. Um, but um, um, uh, yeah, I thought that was interesting what you pointed out. That, uh, you heard that before? No, I had not heard that before. <laughs> it's, uh, not not just like that, anyway. That's very, very pointed. Could you, could you with Mr. Scouts someday? I love that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's... One-on-one? -on -one. Yeah. It, it, it's, his big concern was that he said the whole purpose of that portion of the meeting, which took over the whole other meeting, was he's trying to avert a massive conservative exodus from the Mormon church. Mm -hmm. he, he's afraid that the, the conservatives who oppose the, the vaccine, who oppose the election results, 
or get all leave together. He wants to avoid that. Yeah. Uh, the the church is going through some real serious times. They've had more people leaving the last few years than at any time in their history. And um, uh, so they're trying to accommodate, and that's one reason that uh, they're still kind of in limbo on the um, gay... Uh, right, he brought, that, he brought that up too, the BYU. Yeah, yeah. Crazy. yeah. And uh, they've hesitated to speak out too strongly because they're going to alienate one faction or the other within yeah, the church. Yeah. So they, I mean, they're, they're like yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Anybody else? Um, we, do we have about five minutes yet? Yeah. We still okay. Have five minutes. I, I don't want to infringe on your time. No. Anybody else? Good, I must have answered all your questions. <laughs> uh, well, I, I have one. Um, is there, as far as there's multiple discrepancies in what the prophets have spoken, mm -hmm. how, do they, how do they rationalize that? Uh, I heard one uh, gentleman say that uh, the most current prophet supersedes those who have gone before. So you, you listen to the most current prophet, and if it contradicts what's gone before, it, it's not problematic in their mind. How, how do you feel like they rationalize that? Well, that, that is the standard uh, response because <clears throat> the, the prophets have contradicted each other um, and the, the uh, standard answer is pay attention to the current prophet because we're in a different uh, period than the previous prophets. You know, you're a prophet till you die, so they can get away with it that way. Uh, things were different when Brigham Young spoke or when Wilford Woodridge spoke or somebody else. Um, but pay attention to the current prophet. He's speaking for today, and uh, his word is scripture. Um, so Mormonism actually has uh, the Bible, Book of Mormon, Doctrine, Covenants, Pearl of Great Price, and the, the messages of the living prophets. Uh, those are all scripture to them. The Bible is the least important because it's so old and uh, uh, been mistranslated and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. But yeah, the idea is listen to the living prophet, the current prophet. Hmm. What Bible are Pardon? What version of the Bible do they uh, Well, that's the interesting thing. <clears throat> I'll try to deal with that another time, but um, the King James is the official version that they use in spite of the fact that Joseph Smith rewrote the Bible, and you have the Joseph Smith translation, but it's not their official Bible right now. Uh, okay. <clears throat> well, I think we're out of time for today. Marv, again, thank you so much. Um, we'll continue this for the next five weeks, so please come and invite people to come. Um, and uh, Marv, we really appreciate it. Marv has brought some some literature and uh, a, a book that he has authored that I have found to be extremely helpful um, in in my own life, in my walk, and also uh, in sharing Christ with with my neighbors and uh, loved ones. Uh, so we've got books there, uh, so I'm going to close in prayer, and then I'll grab those books, and you guys are all welcome to have one, okay? Let's pray. Father God, Lord, again, we thank you for this time. Father, give us correct hearts and correct motives, Lord, that we would truly uh, desire to know the truth, not so that we can... Um, that we can belittle others, but that we can help to build them up, that we can help to share the good news of Christ. It is so much better than these man-made stories and fables. Uh, God, your truth is truly true, and it is eternally true. And so, God, we cling to that, and we thank you, Lord, uh, that you have preserved your word for us, that it is inerrant, that it is infallible, um, and that you desire that we go and seek out the truth and, and that you will reveal it to us through your word. And, and Father, we just are so grateful to you for that. We thank you, Lord, that our foundation is built upon Christ 
and that is not shifting sand, but that is the rock. And so we acknowledge all that you've done for us. Uh, We give you thanks and we give you praise. Uh, Be with the next portion of the service, Lord. We pray that you would glorify and magnify your name and that you would use it to uh, sanctify us through and through. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.